Thank you so much. Um, and again, it's a delight to be here where a lot of the people who shaped and taught me have done a lot of their interesting research. Um, I simply have seven suggestions, and they are focused primarily on multidimensional poverty. I think that's why I would be here among uh, the presenters. And by multidimensional poverty, we mean where, um, for the same person or household, a selection of variables are identified that in some way describe pertinent aspects of poverty for that country or that region the attainments or deprivations for that person or household are dichotomized, and so you have a profile of zero or ones, depending whether they're deprived in nutrition or education or water, sanitation, employment, uh, violence. Then those are weighted and aggregated. So for each person or household, there is a deprivation score, or it could be an attainment score, with a percentage of different uh, relevant dimensions and indicators where they are deprived or where they have uh, sufficient attainments. And that vector of dis dis deprivation scores then can be used to make inequality measures or can be made to make po poverty measures. And that's based on a counting approach which has been used in Europe for a great many years. Um, Conchita de Ambrosio um, and others have used it in this community. James Foster and I have worked with it to, use, to build uh, other multidimensional measures. And so the question is where is next for the community both in methodology, in policy applications, and in measurement, um, what is next for this group? And I begin in a sense, very obviously, with a concern for data. And I have a couple cheat slides here. Um, but when inequality, or sorry, adjustment with a human face was published, um, and Andrea Francis Stewart are here, and there was a call at that time for much better statistics for malnutrition and child mortality, much more regular, much more easy to interface with the policymakers. And so the first recognition is that there has been a radical shift in data availability since that time. If you look at PovCalNet, where surveys from 1980 to 2016 number 11, uh, 1,189, um, then we have a base. Now, part of the problem with multidimensional or multi-topic surveys is that there is no PovCalNet. Um, so you have to individually count, you have to define, this work is not yet done. It might be an interesting topic for, for wider, which has done so much on inequality. But there are 980 some surveys, 68 more coming through this year. Um, so it's roughly about like there were five years ago uh, because multi-topic surveys, we start counting in 1985. So there's a, a, a much bigger a uh, mass of microdata, but first of all, it's more poorly documented. So to give a very concrete example, the Atkinson Commission on Monitoring Global Poverty that released its report in 2016 called for a measure of multiple overlapping deprivations that included work and personal security. Um, with UNDP, we make a, a measure which does include the other four dimensions under consideration. How could one find out the data availability to add those others. Again, there's no um, easy archiving of data. So we had to individually open 100 surveys for 5.5 billion people, look at the response code, look at who was interviewed in the household, look at the, the wording of the question in order to obtain information on what was available. So the first observation is that just in terms of the existing data, archiving it and sharing it in a way that's relevant to the research community is an ongoing need. We did find you know that 54 countries home to 4.6 billion people have data on whether the woman has worked in the past week or the past month, year, um, self-employed type of application, but not whether she is in the labor force. And so we also couldn't use this and many are in that position. So there's also in a sense a need for a citation index of survey questions. Which survey questions are actually used by the research community, by the policy community, so that they can be awarded and unused questions that waste time could perhaps be discontinued. The other big data need is for data on the joint distribution of deprivations. So I mentioned that for a multidimensional measure, you need data for the same person or the same household. And when you look at the big data movements um, or the merging of administrative data sources, often you're not able to return the joint distribution. And that has some value added that other 
data sources than household surveys at present are hard pushed to deliver. But if you look at the World Data Forum in Dubai, there's one session on a household survey, and it, the title is Innovate or Perish. So where is the cutting edge pushing forward household surveys with the same energy as big data, uh, making them faster, making them easier? It's an interesting question. Second, topical indices. Um, so there is a call now for individual child measures that reflect child's well-being from aged zero to 17, or for gendered measures. Um, which compare women and men. And for each of these, you need to select dimensions, indicators, weights, and cutoffs. Um, and any index like these, including the current widely used indices at the national and regional levels, um, have big questions about the indicators that are in use. If you look at the World Development Report, you know that schooling is a bad use for education. But every single multidimensional poverty measure, which is officially put out by countries, uses years of schooling as an indicator. Um, and similarly, for a new novel measure like children, what is the equivalent of attending school for a one-year-old? Um, uh, there, are, there are lots of conventions that still need to be developed. And I think that's an exciting conversation between sectoral experts and measurement people that by necessity need a few very strong indicators that proxy others. Um, and Again, there is a need for better data information. So if you look across all of the demographic and health surveys and multiple indicator cluster surveys, um, it's hard to find the right combination of indicators present to make a good child poverty measure just with child labor and some cognitive development dimensions. We can do for t just over 20 countries and under 2 billion people. For a gendered measure, no. For a women's measure, less than 30 countries, 2.5 billion people. So we also need systems of looking at what is jointly available and what are better indicators. <clears throat> the third area um, is that a number of governments now use multidimensional measures as official national poverty statistics. And they are running ahead of research in terms of basing policy on them. So. Um, uh, the government, for example, of Bhutan or uses the MPI to allocate its uh, budget across the 20 districts of the country. Um, they also, uh, this is also done in Costa Rica, in Colombia, in Mexico, but the budget simulation exercises, the public expenditure modeling is very much the first generation and it needs a great deal more research. Um, similarly, um, and at the other end of the spectrum, there are interesting innovations within countries, not only in targeting, not only in um, monitoring, but also in management. So President Santos of Colombia at the beginning of his term engaged McKenzie to take the multidimensional poverty index of that country, which reflects their national plan, and turn it into a, a tool for management, um, which could track change and um, realize results within a given time period. And so that interface between measurement and management might also be explored, bearing in mind the data limitations. Um, a, a fourth area is very much more academic, and it is about methodologies of analysis. Um, if you think of the sustainable development goals focusing much more on interlinkages across indicators on the need for multisectoral or integrated policies, and on recognizing multidimensionality, not just of poverty, but also of well-being and other things. And you look at our bag of econo econometric te techniques of structural equation models or endogeneity um, instrumental variables, they really are not keeping up with the needs and the recognition of the deep interlinkages. And so I think it would be interesting to really try to come up with uh, quite a, a, a radically different bag of analytical tools that could look at some of these interlinked phenomena. You can still do standard things, macro fixed, across, fixed effect models with public expenditure, institutions, growth on the right-hand side, but there's a need to go beyond that, um, particularly when you're looking at sequencing um, and also the, the cost savings from integrated programming. There's another area which is very, very different and where I think we are missing something. And that's at the interface with the respondents to the household questionnaires. If you think of poverty measurement, it's extractive. You take the data, you analyze it, you give it to the policymakers. But what about the protagonists of poverty? Um, there's an interesting experiment. There are many of these, but one of them is Fundacion Paraguaya, where at the end of the 
enumeration interview, they try to have, a, which is done on a, a little computer, they try to then feed back to the respondent their profile and have a conversation of what could be done by that person or in that community. Now, that's a tough thing to do. Most survey enumerators don't have the people skills to have a closing conversation. Most of our technology right now can't give the respondent their profile. But I think it would be, if we're trying to advance an empowering agenda that gives agency to the poor, it would be an interface worth exploring. Um, there's also a, a strong set of topics in measurement methodology. For example, at the moment, the counting-based measures dichotomize. And so that is very rigorous and can be used with ordinal data. But if you have a cardinal variable like income, you're missing something if you simply dichotomize. Um, and so how can we have hybrid measures that really do look at depth of poverty and cardinal variables and yet blend them with ordinal uh, and binary qualitative data? Uh, there's, there's certainly room for innovation there. Similarly, we, as came up yesterday with James Foster uh, and Eric Florbeck, there are many, many robustness and sensitivity tests. But when a country has regions with a lot of inequality, considering standard errors, or if you have regions with very different population shares, the robustness tests, in a standard sense, do not apply. And so you need to go beyond them. Um, and also, there's a big call for imputation for years when not all variables are present. And yet, at present, the multiple imputation models don't return the same joint distribution that we obtain from primary data. And I think the last area is really of recognizing that multidimensional tools are just one of many sets of tools that people are using. And perhaps here's a need to step back and perhaps develop what James Foster was calling proto-axioms. If you think of the headcount ratio, it's not a beautiful measure, but it's used because it's intuitive. It can be understood. Similarly with the HDI, which is being launched today in New York. Um, these are not wonderful measures, sophisticated measures, but they have an ability to communicate. Another example is Sir Tony Atkinson's recommendation that dimensions be roughly equally weighted, chosen so that they were equally weighted. Why? So they could be communicated to policymakers. Um, and so there is a need to think about the poverty and inequality measures that are developed in terms of their ability to be communicated to people who don't wake up in the morning wondering um, how to make a good poverty measure, whose primary consideration is something else. I happen to, but it's okay. Um, and so let me give you a couple examples. As I mentioned, there's a big industry to make uh, very much better child measures, and one would hope very soon better gendered measures, individual measures of deprivation. But if a country has an official national multidimensional poverty measure, and they've finally gotten their mind around its dimensions and indicators, its use in public policy, its use in budgeting and targeting, and then there's a child poverty measure with completely different indicators, dimensions, and weights, and then there's a gendered measure, and then a worker's measure, and then an elderly person's measure, then quite soon there is simply inertia, there's overload, um, there's data deluge. And so a question which may be on the borderline of research, um, but I think is one we should not ignore, is what are the ways of making a user-friendly but more rigorous package of analyses, both unidimensional and multidimensional poverty measures, that can be understood and used together, and which don't create the deer-in-the-headlights kind of fright from the amount of information that has to be digested in order to be used to guide policy, and yet does better than any single measure a household measure, a child measure, a single monetary or multidimensional poverty measure. And related to that, there's a big need for better work on the integration between monetary and non-monetary multidimensional measures. To give a closing example, um, in, let's say, Chile, 14.5% of people were income poor, 20.4% were multidimensionally poor, only 5.5% were poor by both measures. In Bhutan, Similarly, it was about a quarter in 2012, and then also a quarter with new poverty numbers in 2017. So there's a large mismatch between monetary and multidimensional, which may be partly because of the volatility of data, but it also may be a, a big difference. And because most cu countries now um, have both measures side by side, there's a need to figure out how to operate both of those together. 
And so I think uh, recognizing not everybody wakes up wanting to think about measurement, that the purpose of measuring poverty and inequality is not to please ourselves, but to be useful to uh, those who can be more active than we can in eradicating it. These could be some of the, the questions for the way ahead. Thank you.